Wow. Hello, South by Southwest, and then I know there's streaming, so hello, Internet. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My first time here, as, as you said, was in 2006. And I was making web pages for artist friends. I was taking pictures and obsessively uploading them to Flickr. I was shooting videos and putting them up on the, the archive.org before YouTube. And I made all these friends on the internet. And then I knew them pretty well just because we would share so much of our lives. And then I came to South by Southwest and started drinking with them. And um, started having dinners with them. Started doing, coming up with things beyond the walls of the conference that were fun. So if, there's any, if, you're, if this is your first time to South by Southwest, welcome. And you're in for a great ride and some good food. OK, so um, let's go right into this. So I've got a bunch of stuff to tell you about. Uh, first of all, I'm wearing a jacket from Screwly Rec. It's basically, I love this guy, and he makes these, these things that are, uh, that are use old materials, felt and wood, but new digital design tools like MakerBots and laser cutters. And they pr he goes through prototypes and prototypes until they're ready for his store. I got started with uh, making stuff when I was, this is me at about seven, and that's my little brother on the, on the big wheel. And we, I got started because I started working on bikes. I worked with an uncle, and he, would, he brought me along with him on the trash routes at about 4 a.m. to go pick up all the good trash, which we'd fix up and then sell it, uh, I'd sell it and sell on the weekends at um, you know, junk, junk, junk meetups. And uh, we put together a bike, and I got hooked on this feeling uh, that you get when you fix something. If you fix something or you've made something, you know it's like a, it's a real rush. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it, it feels really good. You want more of it. And so later on in my life, I started, I gathered a group of people and we founded NYC Resistor, a hacker collective in Brooklyn. And the idea was basically get a bunch of people together who are the smartest people in New York and share a clubhouse with all the tools we could ever want to make anything. And beyond the tools, though, we also had each other as friends and the experience of each other to make, to make, to make anything. And that, that combination of friendship and tools you know, let, let us to feel like we can make anything. And so what did we make? We made a machine that can make anything. And um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a, a MakerBot is a machine that's a 3D printer. And it, it works by drawing a picture and then lifting up a little bit, drawing another picture in, in molten plastic. And when it's done enough layers, your digital design has turned into a physical design. And what I'm excited about is the next industrial revolution. Where, in the same way that if you were, if you're, if you go back in the in time and you think about like the way that Photoshop changed the way that photography worked, or you think about the way that computers changed the way that we think about everything, or any number of, of innovative milestones, you, it for us MakerBot is all about empowering people to make stuff, and we're dedicated to supporting creative explorers to make wonderful things. Um, and I already mentioned this stuff. So basically, we're messing with stuff. We're making it affordable. We're making it so you can make stuff faster. When we started MakerBot, before MakerBot, actually, we wanted a 3D printer, but we couldn't afford one. They were mainframe size machines, and they were like 100 grand, and we couldn't afford one, so we had to make one. And when it worked, we quit our jobs and started MakerBot. And it's when you stack up the build volume, the resolution and the cost, it's just like, it's an awesome thing to get. Um, we also started, actually before we started MakerBot, we started a site called Thingiverse. Thingiverse is a universe of things. It's the place to download digital designs and share them. And uh, it's going through an amazing, there's a renaissance going on right now. It's never been easier to make and share actual designs. That's going to be one of the themes you hear me talk about a bunch, is creativity is now much more accessible in the thing world. In the same way that you know, Dreamweaver 2004 unlocked websites for a lot of people, MakerBot is unlocking the ability to, to make physical things. And we just launched something on Thingiverse called the Customizer. And this lets you, if you have a Nokia Lumia phone or you have a, we have another one for the, for the iPhone, you choose your phone and then you choose what design you want and you can customize it and you can make a customized 
back for your phone. So this is another way that it's, it's, we're, we're trying to make it accessible and fun and playful to get people over that hump into, into becoming makers and becoming creative explorers. My favorite thing on Thingiverse, this is, for those of you with kids, this is, this is genius. This is a connector from Brio Tracks to Duplo Blocks. Neither of these companies would make this because they're separate things. But with a MakerBot, you can combine them and make something special. Professionals use this like mad. We sell, our biggest customer I love is NASA, which just, the nerd in me is just like, yes. Yes, I'm, oh, that's so great. And um, it lets people make things faster and cheaper. And even people who already have 3D printers will often get a MakerBot and th you know, prototype their prototypes before they run it on their, their expensive prototype machine. And this, uh, this slide is actually about a week old since since about a week ago, now there's seven of the top 10 architecture firms in the US use MakerBots. Uh, we've got a product that's launching today. Um, the level up is, you'll see this around town, super cool. They prototype this and save tons of money making it on their MakerBot instead of out outsourcing that, that, that process. JPL, I mentioned. Uh, at, uh, they, they, uh, for the Curiosity rover, they had a piece on the Curiosity rover that they had to get prototyped. It cost them 5,000 bucks to send it out. When they had to make another one, they bought a MakerBot. Ford uses them. And they create, it's neat. When you have them, it's sort of like, you know, we grow up all as consumers. And when we want something, we think about what the choices we have to make. Which one am I going to buy? Which one is the best one? And you have to choose between things that where, where somebody has just justified making it. And so they've probably had to make like 10,000 or 100,000 of them. And then you have to pick between like which thing made in the hundreds of thousands do you pick? When you have a MakerBot, you just get to make the thing you want. Um, uh, this is, um, these folks are awesome. This is Thomas Lapoma and his company. They make sleep apnea devices for babies so that you can check whether or not your baby is breathing on your cell phone. The, the RoboHand project. This is a, a project um, being led by two guys. One of them is in Seattle and the other one is in South Africa. And they collaborate using their MakerBot like a 3D fax machine. And there's a boy in South Africa who um, uh, was born without a hand. And it, he, has a, he has a little bit of a wrist, but his fingers just didn't make it. And these two guys are making him prosthetic hands. And this is kind of a big deal because kids usually don't get prosthetics because they're, it can cost up to 10,000 bucks just for a finger, and they're growing. So you'd have to buy one next month, or if you've ever had to buy shoes for kids, you know how this goes. And now he's got two hands, and, it's, it's, you know, they're, and they've, they've got prototypes. This is their, their, their couple prototypes in, and they just, uh, they just made a second one for a little girl, and now they've got a line of people who are ready to, and they're just cranking out hands for kids. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, the Square Helper is another thing that's a, a MakerBot entrepreneur project. This guy, Chris, has a band, and he's the, he's the uh, merchandising guy. And so he uses Square and so to sell t-shirts and, and CDs and all sorts of stuff. And he found that it would twist around a little bit. So he made the Square Helper, and he had to make a choice. He did the research and found out to make, um, to make it the old-fashioned way where you, make an, uh, you get tooling, two big pieces of metal, and they come together and, and plastic gets injected into them and they go It would cost 6,000 bucks to make those two big pieces of metal and then about 25 cents a pop to make the, the little thing. Well, instead he bought a MakerBot and cranks, his, cranks them out on his MakerBot 20 hours a day and when he maxes out that, he'll just get another MakerBot. And when Apple comes out with a new iPod or a new iPhone or a new, um, new iPad, he can just change the digital design in a minute and be back in, back in business instead of taking three months and a lot of money. Oh, I love talking about people who do cool stuff. Casey Hallgren is super, super awesome. She's a set designer in New York City and she has, her sets are on Broadway. And she used to have to make things with uh, glue and cardboard and an X-Acto knife. And now she does her designs digitally and she's, you know, she's not cutting her fingers anymore. They, all the, she runs her MakerBots overnight 
and comes in and gets to talk to the director about what choices they're going to make about the set. And um, they're beautiful. And she does this for her job, but then she makes all these designs. So she started a second gig with a website called prettysmallthings.com selling dollhouse furniture. Cosmo, uh, artist out of LA, and he likes going and using Autodesk 123D Catch to capture 3D, to capture artistic sculptures. And this is a really old horse from the British Museum. And he scanned it and then made a life-size copy. Um, with the MakerBite, you can really only make things that are about you know, shoebox size. But he used 29 shoebox size parts to make this life-size horse head. So you, it, it kind of gets you the idea that if you want to do something, like don't be held back by limitations. You can always find a way around it. We make, we make MakerBots in Brooklyn. And we're really proud of that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. It, the only way we could get products out so fast is because we've got our engineers around the corner from the folks who are putting it together and assembling it. And so when something goes wrong, we can know right away and fix it. Or when we want to make something better, we just make the change right there. Um, there's a lot of reasons that this is better than going overseas. Part of it is fuel costs are going up, labor costs are going up, and, it's just, and uh, there's a whole emerging market in, in Asia, so it's harder to actually get stuff done. Having it done in Brooklyn, we know that every MakerBot that comes out is made with Brooklyn pride, and that means that all the holes are lined up and it works. So that's awesome. So we're starting to see 3D printers show up MakerBots in, in, in schools. And I spent seven years as a school teacher in, in Seattle Public Schools. So this is close to my heart, and it's super awesome to see Kids, when they use when they use a MakerBot, they get this whole, they get an education in manufacturing that usually you would have to go to college for. And you know, basically, we have kids come up to us when we're out in the world, and they're like, "Can you make Lego?" And we're like, "Yes." And they're like, "Just get out of my way." <laughs> um, I think about I think back like. You know, when I was a kid, I loved to put stuff together and take stuff apart and make new things, sculptures and contraptions. And I think back, like, what if when I was 10, I had had a MakerBot? And then I think, like, how much I would have learned from that and how my life would have been different. And I think, OK, we got to get these in kids' hands so that they have the tools to change the future. Natural History Museums use them. This is an elephant foot. Uh, more teacher stuff. This is, a, this is a play set by Thingiverse superstar Emmett. And Emmett is just a really prolific designer, and he shares his stuff. And this is a play set where you print out, there's four different components, and here they're represented by four different colors, and you can basically build your own DNA chain. Um, this is a girl that's happy because um, she is 41 and a half inches tall, and they just got back from an amusement park. Uh, when you're a MakerBot dad, you can solve problems and be a hero. <laughs> he made two orthotics that slipped into her shoes that made her tall enough to ride on all the rides. <laughs> yeah. Um, the new hobbyist made this. He, had a, he has, a, he has a, uh, an espresso maker, and it broke. And there's no parts for it. You can't buy parts for these things. All he could, could do is throw it away and buy another one. But instead, he used his MakerBot to make it so it worked again and uh, you know, restored balance to the caffeinated world. Um, and Messeter is a, is a musician who uses this type of piano that plucks. Um, I think it's called a harpsichord. He, and it, he, um, he made, well, one, he made a little stand for his iPhone so he could you know, tune things. And then there's all these things underneath the iPhone that are all white. Those would have been ultra expensive to have made by somebody else and installed. And he just made them on his MakerBot, cranked them out, and he's back making music. Uh, some people just get them to, enter, to, to, to play with their kids. And it's such a fun process. It's kind of a, a kitten watching a goldfish bowl kind of experience seeing a MakerBot. Um, and yeah, so going back in time, in 2009, I showed up. Uh, we actually started the company in January of 2009. 
And we basically didn't sleep. We literally drank just tons of caffeine, energy drinks, and literally a box of ramen. Like, don't do that. And, um, and at about 8 a.m., our prototype worked, and I jumped on a flight at 10 a.m. to come to South by Southwest. And I basically went to bars and put the MakerBot on the bar and started printing shot glasses, which turned out to be pretty popular. <laughs> they were pretty rough. This was an early prototype. But the idea was it worked, and we, we were ready to go. And um, this is like thimble-sized, by the way. This is like just the beginning. And um, took it around. Oh, you know what? This, let me look, just fix this here. There we go. Oh, missing the top of that picture. Drat. That's a musician that I really like. OK. Let's try that. OK. I, I basically took it and opened for shows with the MakerBot back in the day and made little dodecahedrons and little teeny tiny shot glasses. And it, it was one of those things where we'd made t we, we came here with a prototype knowing that it worked. We went home. We iterated a couple more times in the next like two or three weeks until we were happy with it. And then we put together 20 kits. And we thought, OK, this is going to be great. We're going to have 20 of these things. We're going to sell 10 this month, and we'll put 10 on the shelf. And in two months, that'll give us enough time to make another 20. And this will be fun. And then we sold out instantly, sort of like you know, Kickstarter style of like things going And then all of a sudden, you're, you're wonderfully screwed. Um, we, uh, it was really fun. And it was one of those things where being here and showing the people here, you know, we basically figured out, like, if the internet likes this, we're going to be OK. And it was, that's, that's where we were. And this idea of, and this is kind of the MakerBot way of, we encourage iteration. We make the, the, the material, which is made from corn, so it's a natural bioplastic. We make it affordable so people can make stuff, and then when they want to make another one, they can just, they don't have to stress out about how much it costs. Or if somebody wants one, you can just give it to them, and then you can just make more, because you, you have the machine. We're here today, and I get to do it all again. Um, we've got a new thing that we're, that's under this thing, and we get to ramp it up. We, we, get, we were bringing it here to show you first, to see if South by Southwest and the greater internet likes it. And, um, well, here we go. It's the MakerBot digitizer. And keep in mind that this is a prototype. Can I have like a drum roll? Oh, great. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. So this is the MakerBot digitizer. And um, on it is a garden gnome. And the way this works is, you know, mostly when people design things, they have to use CAD computer-aided design. And this, is, this can be really hard. And we're actually doing a lot of things to make it easier. But one of the things that you can do is you can get, you'll be able to get this, you'll be able to order this in fall. And it will not look like this, because this is a prototype. But what you do is you take something that you want to, uh, you want to copy, and you put it on, the, on here. And you can make things about 8 inches in diameter, a, a column up to about 8 inches tall. And there's, uh, I'll turn it on. There's two lasers, lasers, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and a webcam and a bunch of electronics that basically what's happening here is the lasers are shining here, and the webcam is seeing where the line is. And wherever the line is, it creates uh, points. And then it wraps it all up into a 3D model. So to kind of show you what it looks like, um, got a little video to show you what it looks like on the computer. There it is. It's turning around. And then as it's turning, it's actually bringing the thing into the digital world. If you've seen Tron, this is kind of like what happens when Flynn gets digitized into the game grid. Yes. <laughs> and then it makes it into a 3D model. Um, and then, so then you can make as many copies as you need. You can, you can fill the world with garden gnomes if you want, because you've, you, you've got the power of replication. In many ways, this goes hand in hand with the MakerBot replicator, too. Um, you can scan and create the designs really simply with this. And then you can make as many as you want on a replicator. This is kind of like the, the washer-dryer combo of replication. A um, couple things about it. 
One is this, this changes our company from just being a 3D printer company to a company that's building out a 3D ecosystem. So that, and you know, we really want to find more ways that, that folks can jump in and, and take that first step into being creative and get hooked and feel that rush. And so that we've been working on this for a while. In theory, we probably could have waited until it was done and, and launched it that way. But we couldn't wait. We wanted to show you this and launch it here. And I'm excited. You're going to be able to get it this fall. Yeah. So a couple things, kind of details here. You can see some of the details on the screen. And then basically one of the cool things is that in the past, so this technology, similar to 3D printing, has been around for 25 years, maybe more. And, but it's been hard. Usually it, revolves, it involves, like, it, it, in the past, it's involved lasers and cameras. And, and then it usually involves lots of post-processing, like four or five hours or a lot of time going and cleaning everything up. You know, if there's a, dust, a piece of dust here, it'll find that little piece of dust and it'll register it as part of the thing, which messes things up. Um, so it's, uh, it's I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this. Um, and I think a couple, oh, 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 I'm really excited about this. So um, I mentioned the Tron thing. And I guess what I'm curious about is, so we've just got a garden gnome here. We chose this because uh, you know, it's the right size, it's playful. And I'm just curious what, if you had one of these, what you would digitize, what you would, uh, you know. I, I think about, you know, when I was younger, I had a, plastic, a collection of you know, every plastic dinosaur ever, ever made. And um, I gave those away when I, when I grew up, but I wish I could go back and have all those as 3D models so I could share them with my daughter. Uh, I think that, uh, you just think about things, you know, if you put your MakerBot, MakerBot goggles on and you think about, okay, if it's smaller than this, I can, I can replicate it. And then you start going out into the world and you're like, okay, you know, this, I can replicate this. I don't know why you would, but you could. Um, and the whole idea here is that it's easy, it's friendly, and it's another pathway into the 3D world where you can make things and it's not hard. So that's, so I just have to get, I, I'd love to get a round of applause for my team that sweated really hard to get this here today. So my next announcement is that MakerBot, we just teamed up with Autodesk, and Autodesk makes AutoCAD, but they also are, have come out with all these insanely cool applications that are friendly, the 1, 2, 3D series of applications. And my favorite one is this one that lets you make creatures. It's called 1, 2, 3D Creature. And you can download it for your iPad, and then you can make really creepy or friendly or wonderful or um, absurd characters, whether you want to make it look like a gorilla or you want to make it look like, you know, a 12-legged insect, you know, attack from Mars. Uh, and you, you, we're going to be over in their booth and you can come check it out and see all the good stuff we're doing with them. Um, so I've kind of already said this. I'm trying to basically, it's not just that I want you to buy things. I actually want you to be creative. I want you to feel that rush when you make something and it's yours and you're in control of it and you can do really cool things with it. And um, it, it's really fun. And so I do actually in encourage you to join us and help change the future. And, and, and I think one of the cool things about this, and I'll just end here, is that uh, you know, we're launching hardware at South by Southwest where usually, or in, for the last like six or seven years, we've seen lots of social media stuff launch. It is the best time to get into hardware. Get a MakerBot, get into electronics. Electronics have become a lot more friendly. And you know, join the next industrial revolution. Be empowered. Join us. Thank you. So now we're going to take questions. And we've got questions from the, from the Twitterverse, and if you tweet out something with Ask Pettis, we'll see it, I believe. Yep, and so. Uh, this is Steve Garfield, by the way. Give him a round of applause. Old friend. Thank you, Bree. So my name's Steve Garfield. We actually met 2006, and I remember the times of 
we both were learning video blogging at the same time. Yeah. And we, we did become friends online. And then when we met at South By, like a lot of you were meeting each other here for the first time. When we first met, we had that experience of like, wow, I, I feel like I already <laughs> know you. And that was really cool. So um, I've been fr friends for a while. And as a disclosure, I'd like to say that when we first met, I was so, you know, Brie is so exciting. I said, if you ever do something that I can invest in, let me know. And I am an investor in MakerBot. So let's get that Thank out you. of the way. So uh, we asked people to tweet to ask a question. So people, anybody can ask a question so it's not having to run up to the microphone. I think that's a pretty cool thing they're trying this year. Yeah. So the first question is, how much is a MakerBot? Uh, it's 2,200 bucks. So that, and that, um, that machine is optimized to use PLA, which is really where you want to start. That machine is awesome, very high resolution, 410 cubic inch build volume, and it comes in any color as long as you like black. The MakerBot. <laughs> any color as long as it's black. And for the, the ingredients or the plastic, right. is black? Is it black color? You can get black. We, we, have, a, we have like 30 different colors. And, um, so you can make things. And we even, you know, we're kind of playful. So we're like, what if we got some stuff that would make it glow under a black light? And we're like, well, let's try it. And it works. So you could, there's, we've got all sorts of colors and glow in the dark. And cool. we just try things out. Bring up the next question. And let's see. Let's uh, roll the dice back there. And the next question is from Whitney Drake. And it's, where do you think 3D printing will have the biggest impact? You know, um, it, it makes a huge impact on companies that do design, you know, NASA and architecture firms. But I think the story I told of the two guys who are making, who are making prosthetics for kids, it just, that doesn't get much better. That's, I, so I think in the world of forces of good, like using a maker, like where do you think it'll have the biggest impact? I guess my answer is, you know, as a force of goodness in the world. And in that example, the, the architects in NASA are using it for prototypes, but right. in that example, they're using it for the actual end yeah. product. Yeah, that's really cool. And Bring up the next question. Go ahead. When, they're done, when, they're, when they make it, when the kid grows, they can just scale up the model and reprint it. Yeah. That's awesome. Next question. Uh, let's see. Roll the dice. And here it is. Chris Folan. Uh, <laughs> did you print your own jacket? This cool jacket <laughs> This here. jacket is great. Uh, no, this is a... Um, this is a laser cut jacket, and it's felt and wood, and it's just so cool. It's also really warm. Um, but this comes out of it. This is an Icelandic designer, and it's just, uh, I saw this, and I talked to him, and I was like, can I please wear that? And it's just, it's, it kind of looks like an STL file, which is the kind of file format that a MakerBot takes. It is kind of crazy. Because it's made out of triangles. Yeah. And also, we saw recently on the news that there was a, a dress made from a 3D printer, right? Oh, yeah. It's, fashion is one of those things that's coming along where people are, uh, are um, when you have new tools, you know, at some point painting was new, like, right? Somebody, at some point, somebody was like, I'm going to take paint, and I'm going to figure out how to make a picture. And now we have a new medium with, with 3D printing where artists are discovering it, and they're doing wonderful things. So like artists that do data visualizations are making amazing data, data visualization things. And I think we're going to see lots of interesting, more, more interesting stuff happen in fashion. Let's bring up the next question. And while we do, I have an art gallery. I'm from Boston. And I get emails from them. And, and I got a recent email and it said, come in and see these MakerBot produced art. And they have sculptures and lamps made by a MakerBot in the art gallery right down my street. It's amazing. So next question, Renee Herzer. <laughs> Can we print everything in the future? Uh, you know, I love the, uh, the future is so, fu it's so deep. I think I can say yes, eventually. Um, I think, you know, what, right now, the, the, there are limitations now where you're limited to plastic. And, and we did some tests early on, 3D printing with chocolate. And, and we're still recovering from the great jelly explosion of 2009. But um, there's all sorts of possibilities for you know, silicone. And material science is something we're working on so we can start exploring the frontier of what you can make. I, I've seen in the news um, 3D printing of, of meat or, or food, right. and, and a guy is 3D printing a uh, three-wheeled car. So I think if it's a physical object, Bring it oh, on. there's 3D printing of a house, right, yeah. with a huge 3D printer? Yeah. I mean, my personal 
goal is to get a MakerBot on the moon, to build the moon base so I can vacation there. <laughs> nice. Let's bring up the next question. And they're working their magic. Corey Wilkerson, can I 3D print a MakerBot from a MakerBot? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, there's a whole project dedicated to that called the RepRap Project, super cool project focused on self-replication. And um, we had a day maybe two years ago where somebody used a MakerBot to make most of the pieces of another MakerBot. And we knew that it had been possible, but that somebody actually did it in the community and not us was just super cool. That's awesome. Let's bring up the next. And Chris Lloyd says, what is the biggest hurdle to mainstream adoption of 3D printers, price or ease of youth? Both is not an option. Um, it, I, 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 mm, it really depends on who you are. Because if you're wealthy, pr price is not an, an issue. Or if you, if you have, you know, 2,200 bucks is, is means you're committing to something for sure. And I will say, like when we first started, those first 20 machines we shipped out, they shipped with electronics that was like an electronics board, and we shipped tweezers and one of these like uh, things that you put over your head that have magnifying glasses and a syringe of solder and. Then you had to put it in a toaster oven. And those people are like, when people complain, they're like, I had to surface mount my, solder my own you know, stuff and go back and forth to school in the snow. Um, so it kind of is, is relative, depending on what your issue is. But it's affordable. It's way more affordable than it has ever been. And it's a great time to be a creative explorer and see what's going to happen next. Cool. Bring up the next question. And while that's coming up, the digitizer is going to make make it easier to use, obviously. Yeah. When, when, so when people get the digitizer and they put something in here and they turn it on and scan it, then how do they get that scanned in thing over into a MakerBot? So good question. So the way this, so this is just on auto mode so I can show off the lasers. Um, this turns around in, a, in, in less than three minutes. It makes the scan. And then it, there's a USB thing here that connects to your computer so you can literally It'll just send it over the USB. And, and there's host software that, that, that poops it out. Right. So you take the USB, take it out, <laughs> stick it into the MakerBot, and then how do you print? Uh, so, then, so then you take your 3D model, and you bring it into our software called MakerWare. And that lets you scale it bigger and smaller. And then you press print, and it slices it up and sends it to the machine. And next thing you know, you're, you're replicating things. Wow. All right. Next question, Kazumi Terada. Digital printers and ebooks transform printing and publishing. How will 3D printing transform mass manufacturing? So it's interesting. One of the big things is it just gets access to people. Most people don't think like, you know, oh, I want to make this thing. When they think I want to make this thing, they, they might think like, well, I'm not a tycoon. I don't have my own factory. I can't do it. But when you have a MakerBot, you just route right around that feeling. And you just jump in and you do it. And a lot of people, one of my favorite things is when people get them and they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to get one and see what happens. Because they're not afraid to do really wacky and wonderful and absurd things. And the wacky and wonderful and absurd is really close to innovation, being able to push the limits of what's possible. So um, I think the biggest thing is that m just more people are going to get access to the manufacturing process. So actually, it, re it reminds me of the question I asked about bringing the design from here with the USB, taking it out and sticking it in the MakerBot. Yeah. If people did not have the digitizer and they had a MakerBot, they can go online to the, is it, what do you call it? Thingiverse. Thingiverse, yeah. and, and there's a design that people have made. And it, is that yeah. free for them to pull down the design and make it? So there's like 40,000 things that today that you can make that are on Thingiverse that are all free. And you can, if you digitize something, you could share it there and make it 40,001. Um, and so even if you don't have a digitizer and you want to get a MakerBot, but you don't know CAD, right. jump in. You'll be making things. You'll get inspired. And next thing you know, you'll be, able to, you'll be a digital designer. Wow, very cool. Next question is Mike Olson. Uh, from a small donated booth at CES to opening remarks at South by Southwest, any advice for young entrepreneurs? You know, I think one of the tricks you have to go through as, as an entrepreneur is you have to believe that it's possible. And so um, one of the reasons MakerBot worked is because we didn't know how hard it was going to be. So I think in some ways, the best advice I would have for an entrepreneur is to just get started and 
throw yourself into it. Because if you, if you have an idea and you throw yourself into it and it doesn't work, all that energy you put in is still momentum that you bring to your next project. And that momentum, if you do that, you, you, you're just eventually going to succeed. And that's sort of the, that's the make or about way. You try, try again, try again, and until you're happy with the outcome. From, from those initial, the, uh, the first MakerBots that you made, and then you start selling them really yeah. fast, when did you say, OK, this is going to be a company? And then when did it turn into getting investment and becoming you know, a company in Brooklyn with manufacturing? Like that's a, how did that progression happen? You know, one foot in front of the other. We, uh, you know, when, when we started NYC Resistor, it was just natural that we work on a 3D printer project. For whatever reason, we were just like, we want one. Let's see if we can make one. And from there, when it eventually worked, it was just a natural progression to get a checking account. And, and from there, you, know, you have a business. You can start selling things. OK, next question. Uh, let's run the computer in the back. And Mass Relevance is doing a good job with this. Maker Stash, what's been the biggest key to the success of MakerBot? You know, we have this great community, and um, they give us great feedback. And oftentimes, it, with, with hardware, it takes time to make adjustments. But when we need to improve something, our community lets us know right away. And then we double down, stick our nose to the grindstone, and make it happen. And then we're just. I think in many ways, we're inspired by our users. The, people are using MakerBots to do wonderful things. So we just have to keep making it better so more wonderful things can happen. So did the users ask for a digitizer? And we'll you know, bring up the next question while he <laughs> answers that. It's, uh, it's, it's been out, it, you know, there's been DIY kits like this for a while. And the hardware is actually pretty standard. You know, you've got a turntable, you've got lasers and a webcam and some electronics. But the software is really hard. So we'd, we've had people for a long time be like, why don't you just have a scanner? And you know, I went out there and looked at all of them, and they were all super expensive. And I thought, OK, maybe we can do this. Put one, you know, we tried it out, and it didn't work. And then we tried it again, didn't work, tried it out. And then we were like, OK, this almost works. Let's throw some energy at it. And, and there you go. Now, now it's a real thing out in the world that we're doing. So um, you say this is in demo mode as it's turning around here? That's right. Um, in, in real mode, it, do you need a computer hooked up to this, or does it just yeah, is you it self-sufficient here? Yeah, you hook up a computer to it, and you run software here that goes through here, and, and that all connects to make it so that you have it scans your thing. Like when you, when you do scanning of documents, it's right, like hooking up a scanner. Exactly. That's, That's a 2D scanner. scanner. Now we have to think about, like, scanner, you can't just say scanner anymore. You have to be like <laughs> 3D or 2D scanner. That's cool. Uh, Jason asks, uh, ready to start building. What are your recommendations on software? So um, I would go download the iPad app, 123D Creature, and start just playing with that. It's fun because it's playful, and you can just enjoy it. Um, from there, you're going you're gonna to learn a bunch of stuff out of that, and then you can move on up. And there's a whole just suite of 123D stuff you can use that will that will, be, that will get you started. And then if you get really hooked and, and you want to do some serious engineering, you can go all the way up to AutoCAD or, and some of those really powerful tools. So the, the one, two, three, what is it on the iPad? One, two, three D creature. So can I design things? It's designing without the CAD software? Is it, a, is it like a drawing? What's that yeah, like? Yeah, it's kind of, you basically, it's um, the creature application sets you up with sort of a, a blank body, which actually looks pretty creepy. And then you have to draw, you, you extend the arms, you pose them, and then you actually bake it. And, it, and then you can mo manipulate it and add hair and eyes and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's kind of like if you, when you were a kid, if you ever had one of those mix and match a monster books, you can go in and make, make amazing creatures. So the, the end result of that now without the MakerBot is? Is you have a cool model. You have a cool model. Like a, a virtual model. And then how does that interface with a MakerBot once you, if you got the two? So from the iPad app, you actually send yourself the file. To your, so you, send, you email the file to yourself. And then you drag that into MakerWare. And next thing you know, you're making creatures. And, I'm waiting for somebody to do this and then make a bunch of creatures, and they're going to kind of Moybridge style make a bunch of creatures in different poses and do animation. Right. That's, that's coming. That sounds cool. Uh, next question is Ginger Pels. Could I replicate 
eyeglass frames or, or shoes? Yes. <laughs> I right, bring up the next question. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where, you know, eyeglass frames are a little bit tricky because they're pretty thin, and um, you'd have to try a couple times to get it right. And, um, but people have done it, and there's a couple designs on Thingiverse you can download. That reminds me of um, actually a couple of the slides that you put up there. You showed the Nokia yeah. phone case. Now, what I just read about that, I happened to just read about that, and what's interesting is that Nokia open, like open sourced the design of the yeah. case, which allowed you to put it up there for people to then make their own cases, right? It's interesting because they published the design files that they use for injection molding. And um, the back was really thin. And so we just downloaded that design, made some changes so it would work on a MakerBot, and reshared it. So there's, it's, it's a, this iteration process is, I know I keep talking about it, but it's, it's really part of how you know, next generation is, of design is going to work. You're going to be able to just try things and get there one way or another. It's kind of like agile software. You know, you want to iterate as quickly as possible. You want to publish as often as possible so that you're pushing towards the next thing. So the, the companies with what are normally proprietary designs, they have to be forward thinking to say, hey, let's share this part of it. And it's yeah. actually going to help them. Like, and what about Ford? You showed a picture of an engine. Yeah. What, what is that? So Ford is one of these companies that that's, is a really innovative company. And they uploaded a couple car, car models um, that are like models that you can print out as like toys. And then they took the design file of an engine block, a V6, and uploaded that. And one of the cool things about that is engine blocks are not something you can, if you've ever, if you're a gearhead, you can take things apart and you can see how it all works. But when you build it on a MakerBot, you can actually see it build up layer by layer. And so you can see all the different ways that water flows through it and oil flows through it to keep it, to keep it cool and then to keep it lubricated. And it's, it's cool to be able, that, that companies like that are sharing so that we can be inspired. That's awesome. Uh, next question is from Josh Parolin. Uh, what are the future ways the 3D printer will be able to help those in underdeveloped regions of the world? Yeah, so I think, you know, you know the RoboHands project points again to prosthetics. And then, you know, I think about, you know, not, uh, when, you know, you can think about like being on the, the International Space Station. It's kind of hard to get parts delivered. Um, similar to places in the world that are hard to get to. It would be, you know, I think you, we'd have to solve the problem locally of electricity, but once you've got electricity, it could really, you know, it's in time manufacturing. And it's one of those things where, you know, when you make something on a MakerBot, you're making it right there with the materials right there. It's not being shipped to you from across, you know, the ocean on a boat and put on a, on a train and then a truck and kept warm in a store. You just, just in time manufacturing on your desktop. That's cool on my desk, but it's even cooler in places where stuff isn't available. Like uh, replacement parts, so for you showed an example of a broken thing, yeah. trying to get a replacement where they, it's tough, difficult. There's like 20 different versions of stove top knobs on Thingiverse, so if you lose one, you can just download and make another In one. the um, shower curtain hooks, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question from AARP Technology. How do you see 3D printing tech improving ex accessibility and quality of life for an aging population? You know, uh, I sent my grandpa a MakerBot, and uh, he's, he's 87, and he just jumped right in and is like, you know, showing all his neighbors how it works and getting everybody excited in his neighborhood. And I think that, hmm, I imagine that there's all sorts of things that would be, you know, if, if I was old and couldn't like drive somewhere, it would be another way that I could just make the things that I need. And it's also like a hobby, right? Yeah. And you could, you could have a little a user group and, and get to have um, the MakerBot would f facilitate personal interaction between people. And a yeah. lot of elders are, are shut in and they have, you know, they're lonely. And so if they, they could, it would be a way to get people together, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a, what's that? The witch thing? He's, I think he says open, open source. source. Yeah. So. One of the things that's, so real quickly, old people then open source. Um, one of the cool, th we, one of our power users um, with, uh, when we launched the Thingomatic was a guy down south who had a, a very large boat, a Lamborghini, and he's 87. He spent his life building laser systems. Like, I want to be that guy. 
And his obsession now is making things with his MakerBot and sharing them and bringing them into the world and sharing them with friends. Um, with open source stuff, we really encourage people to share stuff. And we share as much as we can in terms of, because the more you can share, just like when you share your photography, when you share your videos, when you share things, it adds an, uh, it's like a library for the world that, that everybody can use. Uh, next question from Lara Sarf. How can we help get, okay, this is a good one. How can we help get MakerBots in schools? Um, well, probably the easiest thing to do would just be to get one and, and go there. Right, just buy one yeah. and donate it to the school. Um, uh, I think that, you know, we've, we work with a group called Mouse, which is a super cool, comp uh, super cool, like, nonprofit that teaches kids to be IT specialists in their schools. And we get, we give, we, we work with them and got them MakerBots to see what they would do with it. And it's so great for, like, STEM education, for science, technology, engineering, and math, for kids to be able to make what they want when they need it. And you've got like, there's a whole, um, if you're into that, you should go to curriculum.makerbot.com, check it out. And there's all sorts of curriculum if you're a teacher to bring it into your classroom. So curriculum.makerbot.com, okay. Oscar Gutierrez Jr. asks, do you think MakerBot will be part of a smart house? <laughs> like the enterprise, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, you must, must yes. be taking that, of yes. course. I think the answer to that is just yes. I mean. <laughs> It's, uh, I'm looking forward to like voice recognition where we can be like, you know, old school, tea Earl Grey hot. You know, we can make the cup, we can't make the tea yet, but we'll get there. Okay, uh, Katie Bennett, when are we going to start seeing MakerBots at local copy stores, FedEx, Kinko's, to provide more access to all? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Glenn Smody, are all the materials stiff or are there softer materials? Right now they're all stiff, but you know, material science is a frustrating thing. We've, we've tried lots of different materials and you try it, it takes a lot of time, and then you're like, nope, it doesn't work. So you'll see more materials come out as we find them and, and can bring them to people. We wanna do that. You, you said you experimented with chocolate? So that was a problematic? What happened? So we, um, our first machine was called the cupcake because it can make cupcake-sized things. And we thought, well, since it's called the cupcake, we should probably be able to ice cupcakes with the machine. Just seemed natural at the time. And uh, so we put it together an, uh, an extruder that had a syringe. And it basically, instead of extruding plastic, it extruded anything you could put in the syringe, chocolate or uh, silicone or some, Nutella worked really well. And then it, yeah. You, oh, and so then you, you eat could it. do it. Eat your mistakes. So you, put the rest on a cake. There was no market for that. You know, there, I'm sure there is a small market for that, like um, cupcake shops. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. Jose Guzman, has anyone tried to digitize a person yet? So we've got a retail store in, in, in the city, in Manhattan, and you can come on in and we'll scan you. And then you can choose, we'll, ma we'll make you a copy of yourself, small, medium, or large. And so you have. You. Yeah, so that's, that's actually really fun. I brought my daughter in and scanned her, and that was my gift to the grandparents. It's, and so that's, I know you have a store, so for people who are watching, where yeah. is that? It's on Mulberry Street, just north of Houston in NoHo. Okay. Um, Pernil. Tranberg asks, let us hear your thoughts on copyright. What, what do you tell Lego? So um, I'm a huge Lego maniac. So uh, we don't want to mess with Lego if we can, if we can, if we can, we want to be friends with them. Um, and I think, you know, when you, when you make a, a Lego brick, you know, you're looking at like 10 or 15 minutes per brick to make it. Maybe a little, maybe a little less, maybe seven minutes. I have made one recently. Um, so it's not like you're gonna, we're, uh, it would be, it's not the most efficient way to make Legos, but let's say you get your head scanned at the MakerBot store and you wanna put your head on your latest Lego creation. That's would, where I think it gets would. really exciting. Yeah. And um, you know, just like copyright stuff on Thingiverse, we occasionally get DMCA takedowns from, from copyright, by, from, from people who think that copyright is being violated. Okay. 
David Lee King says, what about oh, MakerBots yeah. in libraries? Good idea? Yes. Um, libraries are trying to figure out what to do now that we're all reading Kindles. And, um, <laughs> and one of the things that they're coming up with is community centers where people make stuff together. So there's a bunch of libraries, library initiatives where they're getting funding to go and put laser cutters and MakerBots in libraries. And you can come in and basically rent time on them. There's also, um, I should also give a shout out to Tech Shop. There's an awesome tech shop in, in Austin. And they've got MakerBots. They've got uh, among tons of other tools. And it's a great place to go and get access. That reminds me of the project you had um, in museums where art right. was scanned. So there's a, what, how, does, how, how did MakerBots and museums work together? That was fun because I um, we went to a, a we went to there's a program called One Two Three D Catch another One Two Three D program where you can scan things by taking photos, and we went to a museum and scanned all sorts of great works of art, and went with a bunch of artists and then we promptly mashed them up and put different arts on different heads and and had a lot of fun with that. Cool. You can make a mini museum with your MakerBot. Uh, next question, Emily Remland. Could 3D printing have a role in solving the issue of outsourcing US jobs overseas? Well, MakerBot is an example of that. Yeah, I mean, um, we make these things and we assemble them in Brooklyn. And we get as many things as we can kind of locally. And uh, it's really great. I mean, manufacturing is not something, you know, when, when I was a kid, I, went, I had metal shop and wood shop. And kind of part of the idea was, you know, when you could grow up, you might work in a factory making things. And that went away with, with wood shops and metal shops. And now with MakerBots, you can see, you, there's, there's, you can see that there's a, there's a new avenue for people to be creative and enter the world of manufacturing. So we're seeing startups use MakerBots to jump in and do things. Uh, next question, Michael Senkow. Um, <laughs> oh, are you hiring? <laughs> this is a great final question. Um, yes, uh, we've got 50 jobs open right now. So, um, and I believe it's March 14th or 15th, we're having a job fair. Come see us. We, we are growing leaps and bounds, and we're, we're looking for smart people to work with. That's great. Okay, Bree Pettis, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Right on. Cool.